get them that in there. Hi guys, welcome. I'd like to do it from the top. See some names I know, some names I don't, some names I'm looking forward to. Girl, Andre Johnson. That's okay, I can. Hey, Isabel. Hey, Nandy. Oh, where are you from in San Francisco, Donna? Where are you calling from? Hey there, I'm in the lower hate. Ah, I, I'm a big San Francisco fan. My husband is from Burlingame, so okay. I'm a Bay Area adjacent gal these days. Well, good to see you. We've got, okay. we got a lot of fog today. we been running in the cold. What, wait, what, uh, what's his name again? I need the cold. Carl. Carl, Carl the Fog. I remember the first time I saw it, I was like, oh, that is really, he needs his own name. Carl is a living, breathing human fog. Yes, and he also has a, a Twitter site, so, or X or whatever it's called now, but you can yeah. follow Carl. Oh, uh, Carl's Twitter sounds great. <laughs> and, and, and what's the temperature there? Uh, it is three o'clock and the temperature right now in the lower height is well, 63. Uh, oh, the dream. Aren't we, all, aren't we all jealous? Right, Frank? <laughs> yeah. It was not fun last night. It wouldn't be fun. Oh. To, you know, it was fun uh, last night, but the heat's not fun. It's the yeah. kind of humidity that makes your smooth hair do this. <laughs> We're going to top out Sunday at 67. Wow. <laughs> Sorry. We're going to wait just a few more minutes to see who else wants to join. Not so bad. No? No, maybe. Anyone else having a real fun weather like we are in New York right now? Yeah. It is hot, which would be fine if it wasn't hot and humid. But it's both those things. But also, I feel like we can't really complain too much because there's like some real heat waves going on in other parts of the country. <laughs> so it's like yeah. my phone had a heat advisory for being like 90, maybe. And I was like, yeah, but we're not like 103. Yeah, it's also it's also much more humid though in New York. Yes, that's what makes it worse. Yeah, I was I was in El Salvador the week of July Fourth, and it was hot there because it's Central America, and it didn't feel as hot as it did today. Okay, someone needs to mute the mic. We are all going to mute. Don't you worry. Once we start presenting, I can promise you that. Thank you. Okay, guys, I might, right, I'm going to mute you guys, um, just for now, and I'm going to welcome everybody. Um, we're going to let people in if there are more people that are joining, but welcome to the 2023 TCS New York City Marathon Gear Clinic. We have a lot of information to give you guys. I am not going to talk very much because I know I have gotten a lot of really good information from these clinics in the past. So I'm going to let our illustrious coaches introduce themselves um, and just tell us what your name is, how long you've been with TFK, and um, and we will let you guys freestyle a little bit when you they present their slides, but let's just 
have our coaches introduce themselves. Let's start with Rosie, because you're on the top of my screen. So you can unmute yourself. Please and thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Rosie. I am uh, in my second season with Team for Kids. Um, I loved it very much. I think uh, without being like um, too like crazy or so, uh, last year it was uh, my best uh, uh, rewarding season. When I saw the runners uh, that I had been coaching for the season and seeing them coming off uh, the Pulaski Bridge, the halfway point as they crossed from Brooklyn into Queens. It was so emotional for them and also for me. And I was yelling so much because unlike uh, Coach Dorothy, I didn't have a small megaphone that I lost my voice for an entire week after that. So I couldn't yeah, help it by coming back again this year. Well, welcome. We are thrilled to have you. I'm also Ashley. This is Lindsay. I forgot to introduce, introduce ourselves, but we're super happy to have you back, Rosie. Um, let's you. go with Glenn. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Coach Glenn. I've been with Team for Kids. This is my 17th uh, season. Uh, so we're going to keep it short here so you can get the real information. And on that note, uh, you know, we've heard it all, whether we've been here two years, one year, or 17 years. Uh, and, you know, we learn from you guys as well as, uh, you know, you learn from us. So feel free to ask us questions. And sometimes, like I said, we'll learn from you uh, by a question. If we don't know it, or we have to look it up. But we have a lot of experience here. So feel free to uh, shoot some questions. Awesome. How about you, Ro? Hi, I'm Ro. This is my second season coaching with Team for Kids. Uh, like Rosie said, I have to say I got to run alongside a lot of our runners uh, last year during the marathon. And uh, I have to say that was just so special being on the bridge and queuing up with everybody, uh, really emotional. And I look forward to being posted up at a mile this year and yelling my brains out for you. So um, I'll toss it over to the next one. Yeah, I love it. Um, uh, Dorothy. Hi, I'm Coach Dorothy. Um, I started as a Team for Kids runner, and that was in 2015. I became a coach in 2018. Um, made the same mistake Rosie did my first year coaching and did not have a megaphone. And I learned I only had to make that mistake once. But okay, we'll um, that way. I've done that before. <laughs> we uh, we're here to help you out um, with um, giving you ideas for gear and um, really go on to that Facebook page because there's always plenty of information being shared on the Facebook page. So if you're not a member on that page, uh, sign up. Awesome. Are there any other coaches that I didn't mention? I didn't think so. All right. So we are going to start. Oh, look, there's Glenn right there in the middle. Welcome. Glenn is going to start us off with shoes. And if you give me just one second, I'm going to be able to. Your, your slides are so colorful. They are very colorful. If you give me one second, because Technology is super fun. Let me pull up. Glenn has his own special little deck that he wanted to share with us. It is colorful and beautiful as the official slide. I love it. All right. Recording in progress. Oh, let's mute that. <laughs> All right. I told you they're not colorful. Look at that. Oh. And they were, they, were, they were not colorful at all. Okay, I'm gonna have to share it lo-fi like this. I apologize, but we got it. All right. Doesn't want me to share it big time. So Glenn, have at it. How you doing? Okay, yeah, this is pretty similar to the first slide you saw there. Uh, yeah, when it comes to shoes, you walk into a store, you, you know, you go online and you have all these different terms and different types of shoes. And it can be quite confusing. You can see, there you go. You know, you'll see stability, you'll see 
flat, you'll see something that says neutral cushion. What does it all mean? What, what do we need here? Next. Okay. So did, let me just break down what the different types of running shoes are. So we'll start on the left. There's road, road, road shoes, trail shoes, track spikes. We're not going to concern ourselves with trail or track spikes. But within the road shoes, you have racers and you have trainers. And that's going to be important because I'll discuss that in a little bit. Now, within those two groups, you also have then stability, neutral, and cushioning shoes. So let me explain a little about this. Next. Stability. That you probably go into a store, you've heard it, you know, thrown around. Oh, you overpronate, you underpronate, you are, are neutral. What is that? Sorry about the blurriness here, but I thought this was a good shot to really explain. We all, pronation is the rolling inward uh, as you have the foot strike. So you see on the upper right, upper left, excuse me, uh, as we come down, we all hit there. So there's a certain amount of pronation that everyone has and that is, that is normal. So you see in the normal column, they also have it. But the difference is, is over pronation, you roll in too much, under pronation, you actually are reversed, where it, if you look in the uh, uh, right, the, the bottom ones, you can see where the person's coming in. So we're all gonna come on the heel, roll in a little, question of how much, or are we inverting it the other way? So now, do we need to fix this? Hmm, good question. Next slide. Okay. So what do we, hold on, hold on. Why are you doing them so quick? Because I'm not technologically advanced. <laughs> <laughs> you okay. don't want to go back. So I won't go back to the fourth one. It's okay, so just, keep them out. Pretend the other two aren't there. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, you know, rather than, when I was just quickly putting this together, yeah, you know, over the years that I've been in, uh, involved in running, which, which goes back many, many, many decades, uh, I've seen the evolution of shoes. And there's been a lot of studies. And I, I've read some of the studies. I follow science people uh, you know, online, on Twitter, uh, different places. So I try to keep up on this stuff. And, and rather than me just quoting to this study or that study or this book, I found something that, you know, really boils it down to, to the basics. And that's a New York Times article that was just from a few months ago. And it was, you know, it was asking what you do and don't need in a running shoe. So this is straight from the article, which I agreed with. Uh, and you can pull it if, if you want, and that's why I put the date in there. So they begin by telling us that marketing departments and running store clerks often oversell certain features, especially to newbies. We know that they're gonna, you're gonna go in and they're gonna say, you need, underline word need, you need like a little kid, mommy, mommy, I need this. You know, I need Barbie. Uh, you know. Uh, the question is, do you really need it? Uh, and as I said before, they'll say you over pronate. So we need to get you a motion control shoe or a stability shoe. But guess what? I was saying all those studies that they've done, the current e evidence does not bear out that going in that uh, type of shoe or stability really uh, protects you and gives you less injuries. As I was saying, pronation is a natural part of your running gait. Next. No, okay. So- There was one more, there was this, one more bit on the slide. So I, I took this quote in. In other words, the shoes may end up presenting a total problem that you might never have had because they were saying you need this. I mean, plenty of time to practice. Someone says, you know, I've started to get this little ache over there. You know, when I got new shoes a week ago, you may not need that. That may cause a problem. Next. What about cushioning? So we talked about, do you need stability? 
But let me just say one more thing on disability and neutral. I'm talking about you go to a running store and a lot of these people are very, very knowledgeable. I'm, I'm not trying to any way, uh, you know, demean them. The, oh, many, many, many are extremely knowledgeable, but their job is to also sell your shoes. Uh, and that's what they do for a living. Different if you go to a doctor or a podiatrist and they see you have a leg discrepancy, discrepancy or you're constantly getting injured, then you might now we're back need and listen to the healthcare professional that tells you that. But what about cushioning? So cushioning gives you that thickness before. And what's interesting is our feet like to sense the ground. And so by putting too much in there, you're not getting that feedback and you might be putting more stress rather than it being soft there, it brings up and, and more stress on other parts of your body. So you have to be careful there. And we're not gonna go through that, but one thing where I did, I personally have found cushioning beneficial is during the winter when everything gets a little harder because it's like 10 degrees or 15 degrees outside. So having that extra cushioning actually helps some of the harder impact because it seems like you're running on, on you know, really hard you are ground at that time next. So ultimately what you need to do is to find, uh, well here I, I was saying again, if you, know, you, you uh, listen to your healthcare professional, uh, they have shown that no more or less getting shin splints and stress factors occur with the different types of shoes. Uh, you know, the, the Times looked at the Co a Cochrane study, which takes all the studies that are out there and assessed them. Uh, and they looked at over 11,000 runners with 12 different trials and, and they didn't see any injury. So again, look what's good for you. Let's go to next. Okay. Oh, I forgot one thing before. So now we're here. We got two more minutes for this. You got it. We're at the end. Uh, tough, <laughs> tough, aren't they? So, <laughs> What about super shoes? Those are shoes that every manufacturer has. And those have been starting to be studied. And the truth is they do improve, these do improve running uh, economy. And by improving running economy, it does shave off your time, but it's not gonna do that necessarily for everyone. And they still, they're so new, they haven't looked at long-term data about injuries yet. Next. Next. Okay, so what do you do? If the healthcare professional tells you to get a certain type of shoe, listen to a doctor. Absent that, find a shoe that feels good for you. It doesn't give you blisters. You haven't lost your toenails. You know, it's kept you injury. I've been running in the same shoes because I don't get blisters. I haven't lost toenails. And you know, everyone gets some injuries, but on a whole, not, not a ton. Stay with that. That's what you need to find. What else? You may want to consider two different types of shoes. One benefit, you can get a neutral and you can get a stability. Alternate between the two. That, that strengthens so there's no repetition in your strike. And when you're running, you're going to run differently in each and you'll actually strengthen the ankle and the, and the muscles going up. Uh, so they've actually shown that it reduces injuries. Let's, I have some last minute tips here talking about it. When do you replace the shoes? Uh, anywhere between three and 500 miles, it's gonna differ on the shoe, it's gonna differ on the person, it's gonna differ on the terrain. A lot of factors go into it. I think on a whole, you tend to say, you know, this shoe's had it and time, time to switch off. Next, when you find that perfect shoe, guess what? Buy multiple pairs. And I don't work in a shoe store. Why? Because a manufacturer may discontinue it. That's happened to me. And then you go, oh no, and you got to find something else. This way, if or when they do, you have backup pairs. At the very least, buy two pairs, okay? And why two are the same? We were talking about two before that you alternate during your training. And one could be a trainer, one could be a lightweight racer, or one could be that the super shoe. Uh, that you're switching. And, and when you're doing speed work, you can put on the lighter, then you wear the trainer. But absent that, we're talking about two pairs uh, 
if you don't do that, two pairs, one for race day and one for your training now. The one you have for race day, we want you to do a long run in them because you don't do nothing new on race day, a few short runs. Oh, I no, you can keep talking. Day. You can keep talking. I just want to switch There was one thing the... for them to see. Oh. oh. Uh, so um, I, I have that one other point, but now they can't see. Okay, uh, so I forgot. And you keep, then you put a little time on, on them in a couple, uh, on a couple other runs, then put them away and hold them till race day. And you take out those kind of new cushiony shoes that you've used a few times and you put them on, lace them up race day and you're all excited. Uh, just to tell you a great place to buy overstocked or older versions of New Balance, which, which makes, you know, they're a sponsor, but they make good stuff and clothes. And some even NYRR branded stuff is a website that you see there, joesnewbalance.com. And we'll be sharing this, yeah. and we'll be sharing Glenn's deck in the chat and in subsequent emails as well. Um, so don't worry if you want to make sure that you've seen it, we'll get it to you. Okay. So we're going to thank you, Glenn. That was awesome. Cause shoes, shoes, shoes is where it's at. Uh, let me see, we're going to go to slideshow slide. Ah, oh, there we go. All right. Who is next up? I believe this is Dorothy. Yes. Um, so how do you read the weather? A lot of people will go on their phone and they'll say, oh, it's 75 degrees. And they dress as if they're going to be sitting in the park at 75 degrees. Um, our body heats up. So we actually want to train as though it's maybe 15 degrees uh, warmer than it is. Secondly, we have to remember that sun versus shade makes a big difference. Wind makes a big difference. And the summertime, humidity makes the biggest difference. So you want to really look on your weather uh, report on what real feel is. D don't pay as much attention to just the weather, but the real feel. And um, if you're running where you're running, if I'm running in Central Park on the bridle path where there is lots of shade, um, it's going to feel much different than if I'm running on the West Side Greenway where I'm in direct sunlight most of the time. Um, so those are all things that you want to consider when you're thinking about the weather. Uh, check the weather report the night before so that you can prepare all your stuff. Um, so when it's hot and humid, how do we keep from chafing? Now, there are plenty of products out there in the market. I happen to like, um, there's a, a product called Squirrel Nut Butter, but you can use Vaseline. There are many, many different glide. Um, and you, but where to put it? Think of anything that rubs up against your skin. And um, usually I've, I've gone for runs where I've worn the same outfit and it's a 10 mile run and I don't get any chafing. But on that 15 mile run, I may start to chafe. So you want to be prepared. It's better to, to be over um, glided than under glided. And some of them also come in like little packets that you can just put in your um, run belt or in your pockets just so that you have it. You feel some chafing starting and you put it on because the worst sensation is jumping into a shower after a run and you have chafing. It's, it feels like a wasp has stung you. Um, another big thing is sun protection. Now, if you're on the Facebook page, you know that I did a post about sunblock versus sunscreen. Most people think that they're interchangeable. They are not. They're both great for protecting your skin against the rays of the sun. But the big difference is sunscreen allows the heat to enter the body, whereas sunblock, you don't get warmed up from the rays of the sun. So that's another thing to consider when you're outside. If you're using sunscreen versus sunblock, you might feel much warmer with the sunscreen. So, um, and those also come in little sizes. You want to apply it before you go out. You want to make sure you get every place. They have some that are sprays. And if I'm doing a three hour run and my sunscreen lasts for one hour, I need to have another one with me to reapply. 
Um, don't forget important places like your ears. Um, they have stuff to protect your lips. Um, I'm Mediterranean, I'm Greek. So it's like, oh, it's okay, I don't burn. It's still important to protect your skin. Um, trust me, when, you're, when you get into your late 50s, you're gonna be happy that I said that. Um, another thing is preparing your hydration. There is prehydration during your workout hydration and post hydration. Now, one of the products that I like is called Liquid IV. And here are two different Liquid IVs. And if you think, oh, I'm just getting this brand Liquid IV, this one's a hydration multiplier. This is an energy multiplier this isn't gonna do the same thing that this does. So when you're looking for something for your hydration, make sure it says hydration on it. Um, this has caffeine, which actually dehydrates you. Um, and when do you hydrate? Now the, the, um, the rule of thumb is two hours before you're going out for a run, you should drink, what is the, so um, two cups. Two cups of either um, a electrolyte drink or water or a combination, maybe a cup of water, a cup of electrolyte, and that gives it enough time to be in your system. Then five to 15 minutes before you go out for your run, have another two glasses. Now I know you might be like me, I don't like that squishy feeling in my abdomen and my stomach, but it acts as a slow release. When you do it right before your run, your stomach lets that release and then it goes into your digestive tract and it gets absorbed. So, it, so think of it as it helps to maintain throughout the run. You also, everyone sweats at a different rate. There are things that you can go out there and do your body weight and go out for a run and then weigh again and you can get like really scientific and precise about it. Or you could think of every 15 minutes, I want to make sure that I've had something to drink. Now on really hot days, you might have to have more. Um, you don't ever want to feel thirsty. That's, that's the sign that you're already dehydrated. And it takes a while for the body to get back that hydration, to have that engine moving. The second thing is your sweat. If you, if it's hot and humid, your body is not releasing that sweat and it's holding you in and it's actually making you have to work harder to stay hydrated. So it's a good thing if you have a buff, you just wrap it around your wrist and you use it and you get that sweat off of your body. You make sure you have wicking material, just, you know, make sure that the, the less you have perspiration on your skin, the better it is for you. Um, and then post-hydration. After your run, you want to make sure that you bring that hydration back into your body, um, whether or not that is chocolate milk, which fantastic uh, thing to use after your run. Um, different brands, like certain people love Tailwind, certain people love Gatorades. So you have to find what works for you and doesn't upset your stomach. And one other trick, there's these things called salt tabs. They're chewables. So if you don't like to have that sloshy, you know, just having those electrolytes in your system. Um, one, of my, one of my things is I like a little bit of pickle juice. Sounds crazy. Works great. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much, Dorothy. All right. We are going to move on to Ro, who is going to talk about trading in the fall slash colder weather. Now, I don't have a deck or any cool little things to show you because I'm at work. So, <laughs> um, but you're wearing your TFK green. I mean, I am it. wearing my T that I did bring. Um, <laughs> so, fall weather. Now, obviously, you know, we are doing fall marathons, you know, September, October, November. Um, and the weather is going to change. And we are training in the heat of the summer. But at some point, we're going to wake up and all of a sudden the temperature is going to start dropping. Think about it on a normal November race day in New York, we could be anywhere between 35 and we're not even going to talk about last year. That was just a weird anomaly. But, you know, like I would say assume a 40 or 50 degree day and 
we have to think about how to dress for that because it is slightly different, but kind of not really. And let, let me explain. So that same rule where Dorothy was talking about in the summer, hey, we want to think about real feel. When the, when the fall comes around, we have to think, while it's 40 degrees right now, when I start running, your body heats up. So we have to think about uh, when we're running that it's going to be at least 10 degrees, maybe even more if you're, you know, a sweater, I sweat. Um, it can be five degrees and I would sweat as if it's a summer day when I run. So we want to dress for the way we run. And that basically means probably in your marathon outfit, you're probably looking at a tank top, short sleeves shirt, maybe a skirt for some of the ladies that like to run in skirts. You probably won't be wearing full long sleeves. And that's okay because the great part about fall marathons is you can wear some clothing over and take it off when we're, you know, queuing up at the start. Um, fabrics, we still want to think about moisture wick, even if it's, you know, a short sleeve shirt. Cotton is rotten. So as much as you would love to maybe take your favorite scarf and put it around you, just don't. We have uh, so many great items made for runners, you know, neck buffs that you could take and put over your head. You can put on your wrist, like Dorothy was saying, to, you know, take the sweat off. You don't need to utilize products that's not made for sweating and you are going to sweat. Um, in terms of like what to wear, uh, honestly, you know, like I said, you know, you want to wear short sleeves or a tank top while we're running our marathon, but there are some great items like arm sleeves. Now, actually, I wish Dorothy had hers on so she could, oh, look, see, Glenn got a neck buff. I went and <laughs> ran the bridge to go okay, get the neck buff. That was the best and visual. <laughs> so actually, let's talk about his neck buff because as you saw, when he put it on his neck, you can also pick it up and put it over your face. So let's just say, uh, we have some weather that can help put it on his head. It is a multifaceted item. But at the same time, um, you know, you're wearing, you know, your arms are out. There are some great arm sleeves that are moisture wicking. And the best part about them is you can pull them down if you get hot and pick them up when you get cold. And it doesn't even have to be anything uh, fancy. I've done stuff just on a on a pinch, like cut a tube sock and put it on and then just rolled it down just so that when I finished my marathon, I could pick it up and have something to keep me warm until I got to the heat sheet. Um, so yeah, uh, common mistakes that we talk about, like I said, cotton is rotten, don't do it. Um, in terms of like what to wear, even your socks, you know, there are, uh, merino wool socks that are just as great in the summer as they are in the winter. Uh, they're a little bit thicker. They will keep the moisture away from your toes. Your toes can chafe. That also means that, you know you could get blisters. Um, when we think about you know rain and stuff like that, there are whole other things that we can do to prevent um, some of those issues. But in terms of you know everything, wick wick wick. Um, and then hydration. Believe it or not, you may not feel like you need to drink water while you're running or I just feel good, nothing, you know, no. Hydrate. You should be carrying a bottle of water or some sort of hydration, whether it's Gatorade or whatever your drink of choice is. Um, for your long runs, honestly, if there's anything over four or five miles, I have a handheld with me. Now, the great part about the Abbott Major Marathons is we have uh, hydration along the course. That will be the same with New York Marathon. You don't have to carry something, but, um, you know, if you feel like, hey, I can't do this every mile or every mile and a half, you should carry something. And that should be the same on your training. Um, it is just as important in the fall. You can dehydrate. You should be pre-hydrating, hydrating, and post-hydrating just like you do in the summer. That should not change. 
Um, and let's see, I don't think I missed anything. No, and don't worry, you'll get to give your favorite piece of advice at the end too. It, but thank you, Ro, that was <laughs> great. Um, speaking of, well, there's no real transition to this, but <laughs> speaking of things that you need to wear year round in the summer and in the fall, undergarment gear tips from Rosie. Yes, <laughs> so uh, we we often speak about, uh, you know, what kind of shorts are you wearing? Are you wearing a tank top, short sleeves? Are you bringing a buffer, what kind of socks? Uh, people really don't uh, talk too much about uh, their undergarments. Um, so let's start with bras. There are a gazillion bras on the market. Some are very cute. They have all this crisscross uh, bracelet straps in the back and so on. Very nice to look at, um, probably good in a yoga or Pilates class, but definitely not supportive. And even female runners who don't have big breasts still need good support. While we run, and running is a high impact activity, um, our breasts move up and down, up, outward and side to side. So we need to contain all these movements to prevent damage to the tissue, sagging later on, and also pain and sometimes chafing from the rubbing of the two breasts together or maybe with the underarm or so, depending on how big the breast is. Um, sports bra come in three different, um, let's say, um, levels of support. Um, low impact, medium impact, and high impact. Uh, running is a high impact activity. So your first choice would be to look for a high impact bra. And again, there are many, many brands, many styles. Um, also, sports bra, running bras come in three different types. There is the compression type, which kind of compresses the breast against the chest. It's uh, actually the model that we see uh, right now on the slide uh, that, uh, that's on the screen. Basically, the two breasts are together. They are not separated. And it may create the uniboob effect, which is not pretty to look at. And generally speaking, compression bras are better suited for um, women with smaller breasts. Then there are encapsulation bras. Encapsulation bras are bras where each breast has its own side. It might have an underwire uh, or not. Um, and uh, some, bra uh, some bras also have uh, some light padding. Uh, they are usually better suited for women with larger breasts. And then there are uh, encapsulation and compression bras, which do the same. So they compress, but they still um, separate the, the two breasts. What's very important is to look for um, bras that, are, um, that have wide straps so that the straps don't dig into your shoulders possibly adjustable straps so that you can get the best fitting. And some of them also come with a, uh, a band that's also adjustable that has three different sizes in the hooks. Um, again, like any other garment, it should not be cotton. It should be a moisture wicking material so that it dries fast. Uh, it's better when you dry it not to put it in the dryer because the heat is going to stretch the elasticity and the compression of the tissue. So yes, you can wash it in your uh, washer, but then just hang it to dry. Um, another thing, since we are speaking about breasts that usually doesn't happen uh, most to women, but to men and to 
I refer to the few men who are attending this seminar tonight, is uh, a nipple bleeding. Um, the bleeding is co caused by the rubbing of the t-shirt for hours. So <clears throat> there are some shields uh, that look like uh, little uh, round uh, band-aids, uh, similar to the ones that are given to women when they do their mammogram. <laughs> So you can apply that to prevent bleeding, or you also can apply a lot of Vaseline or any other anti-chafing product like Coach Dorothy was recommending. For women as well, um, it might cause maybe not on the first run, but on longer runs or maybe on runs where you sweat more because it's more humid, uh, chafing, especially here by the bend. Um, some women get the chafing uh, in, um, uh, in between uh, the two breasts. Some women get chafing over here on the side. And another thing that can cause chafing is tags. So uh, if you can look for bras and also underwear, and I will speak about underwear later, that are tagless or where you can rip the tag really nice, completely, and that have flat seams or are seamless so that you avoid chafing from that as well. As far as underwear, so the first big question is, should we go commando or not? Personal choice. There are different um, kind train of thoughts. So if you go commando, well, maybe it boosts your self-esteem. <laughs> um, on the other hand, uh, I understand that some people may, some runners uh, may feel uncomfortable. Um, it could be less hygienic, but then uh, you also have uh, less laundry. Um, anyway, whatever you choose to do, do not wear cotton underwear. Uh, wear sports underwear, which are made of uh, moisture wicking material. Again, possibly tagless and seamless or with flat seams. Um, uh, the advantage of wearing underwear, especially for men, is that it keeps everything in place. For women, during the menstrual cycle, during your period, uh, it's usually better to wear your underwear. underwear. Um, it's a personal choice. Sometimes they ride up. Sometimes people don't want to see the line in the back of their um, their running tights, so they prefer not to wear it. Um, I personally, there are also running thongs. Um, I personally find the running thongs uncomfortable, but other people are perfectly fine with that. Uh, whatever you choose, again, um, maybe try, I don't know, maybe try going commando one time, trying to wear one kind of underwear another time and see what works better for you. Please try it during a long run because during the marathon, uh, most of us are uh, three hours I would say even four, average finish time of a marathon is four hours and a half. So I know some of you are much faster than, than, than others. Some are, take a little longer. So consider that you have to wear this item for a long time. Um, speaking of periods, I had uh, last year a girl, um, pulling me aside after the practice. And she was going to ask me, said, oh, I feel so embarrassed. I have to ask you something. I don't know how to ask. And I said, look, I've heard them all. Don't, don't be embarrassed and ask me. And the question was like, I will have my period during the marathon and I don't know what to do. And I don't know how, what, you know, who to ask. And I said, there's nothing to be, you know, embarrassed to ask. So um, obviously the most comfortable thing would be to wear a tampon. Um, they also have the cups now. Um, 
you may want to try those as well. If you're wearing a tampon, remember to cut the string shorter so that it's not rubbing against uh, anything because that also can cause uh, chafing, even though it's a very thin string. Um, I recommend that uh, you go to the porta potty and you change prior to start running when you are in a, before you go to the corrals. There are also porta potties in the corrals. Um, always bring at least two tampons with you because maybe while you're changing in the porta potties, you drop it. And then what happens? So always have a spare one. Um, Another question, another thing that she was asking me was that she suffered from very bad cramps and backache. And what should she be doing about her medication? Well, first of all, none of us here are medical advisors. Uh, so we can always speak from personal experience, but it's something that should be addressed uh, with your own physician. Uh, but if you are there, and there are two school of thoughts about taking anti-inflammatory uh, prior to a long run, running or a, or a marathon or a race. There are those who say, oh, it's okay, you can take it. Others, they say, no, absolutely not because it messes with the, your blood and level of hormones and hydration. Um, my personal take is that if you are in so much pain that you cannot stand, you cannot walk, maybe taking an anti-inflammatory helps. But again, it is something that you should address with, um, with your ph physician and something that you should try in these coming months. So maybe go out for a longish run a day when you have your period and see how you feel and, um, and then decide what to do on marathon day. So these are my tips. Oh, one last thing for men running shorts. I'm sorry, I was forgetting. Me, for it, most really. of them, excuse me. Go for it. <laughs> most of the running shorts have inbuilt liners now. So that already can serve as underwear. So you may not want to actually wear underwear if you are already wearing a pair of shorts that also has the inbuilt liner because that would make three layers can cause too much heat actually. No, that's a really good thing to call out. Thank you for remembering that. Um, You're welcome. That's I, all. I have learned so much from everything that we've done so far. <laughs> um, the next two slides, we're going to keep it quick because... I know that Dorothy and Glenn can, um, that way all of our coaches will get a chance and say their favorite piece of advice and that way we have time for questions. So this quick one is gonna be Glenn. Where'd he go? Are you back from the Verrazano Bridge? He's on mute. Hey, uh, yes. There he is. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm off the bridge. Uh, okay. First, let me tell you what you can't do and prohibited on race day is you cannot bring over the shoulder hydration packs. Uh, the rules actually, I just called them up here. It says the following are prohibited items from NYR races. Uh, they use the uh, camelback term. It's any hydration uh, backpack. But what you can do is you can use the handheld ones or the belt ones. There's two types. Correct. But as was mentioned earlier, uh, you know, in all the marathon majors, but specifically New York, there's pretty much water every mile. There's no water Gatorade uh, on the bridges. And since we start on a bridge, uh, there is no water for the first three miles. Again, uh, you know, if you've trained that way, and it's, it's a comfort item, uh, you can bring it. If you haven't trained with it, uh, don't stress. There's more than enough uh, water out there. Uh, just to let you know, also, uh, I have the rules up here of, of things you cannot bring. It says you cannot bring hammers, saws, or umbrellas. Uh, you cannot bring vaping devices or... Uh, and know. you can find all those rules on the <laughs> nyr.org website. Right, so if I missed anything and you're wondering, like you want to bring your pet, that is on the NYR. It will answer that question whether you can bring it. 
true story because the answer to that is no. <laughs> Thank you, Glenn, for the. Oh, for hey, and- I was you were sending them to the site, so was I. Now, why'd you spoil it? I appreciate you, Glenn. I appreciate you. All right, Dorothy. This one is real simple because it's the three graphics are exactly what she'd yep. be saying, anyways. So nothing new on race day. So we say that all the time. And then I get somebody who goes out and does a one mile run on some with something and they're like, yep, good to go. No. You really want to use that last of your longest runs as a dress rehearsal for what you're going to use on race day. Um, because different things, they might not bother you in the first mile or the first two miles, but on mile 21, you know, it's like an albatross around your neck. So really, um, think about doing your kit, your race kit, um, thinking about it early. Now for me, I do, I do a flat coach. I do my pre-race, what I need, my outer layer, my race day kit layer and my post race layer. And I'll, I'll put them out on my bed and I have everything. What are my socks? What are my shoes? Um, if I'm using compression, I have everything laid out. I take a photograph of it and then I think, have I, have I missed anything? But we definitely want to make sure that we're running in what we practice in, that you have everything set up in advance and um, give it a test. It's like test driving your car, right? So you want to, you want to make sure on that. Um, throwaway layer for the, the day of, my one big thing that I've used with all of my marathons is a bathrobe. Easy to open up, easy to show my number when I'm going through security. Um, I try to get the ugliest, tackiest bathrobe I can because A, that's fun. B, I don't feel bad when I have to toss it because I'm like, okay, you were with me for, you know, four hours in the tent. You'll see amazing ugly bathrobes. It's like an ugly bathrobe contest. Um, I love it. So that's one thing. Also like those cheap hats that you get at like the, the you know, dollar store have a couple of those, those throwaway dollar store gloves or pair of socks. Um, you don't have to spend a lot of money on your on your pre-race kit. So I'm not gonna deprive Dorothy of another favorite piece of advice slash gear because I happen to think that she already nailed it with the ugly bathrobe, but I will give you another opportunity after. But Ro, if you could tell us what your favorite quick piece of advice or favorite gear slash piece of clothing is. Well, for the marathon, I would say it's the arm warmers, whether you buy real ones or do what I did with the tube sock. I love oh, it. Yeah, there we go. Glenn is my model. Glenn, I need everything. you to get an ugly bathrobe now so you can model everything. <laughs> um, and the other thing would be a visor. Yes, a visor. Protect your really face. Good and if it rains, it just shields your eyes. I love it. That's nice. All right, Glenn, I'm afraid to ask. <laughs> well, no, wait, I'll show What's no. yours? <laughs> now, actually, the two things that, uh, all joking aside, the benefits of arm warmers is you can bring them up and down, whether you get hot or cold. The benefit of a buff, and so these are my two favorite things, is as I was joking around, but you can use it as a hat. You can use it on the neck. You can put it on your wrist as a sweatband and, and wipe your forehead. So that's mine. Move on. I love it. Uh, Rosie. <laughs> My favorite piece of, uh, of advice is don't stress, relax, have fun. If it is your first marathon, it's a PR or a PB, personal record and personal best. Take in the crowds, smile when you get closer to Lafayette and you see the me- yourself on the Megatron. Um, tell your family and friends to always be on the same side. So let's say on your on runner's right or runner's left, so that they, if you are seeing them in multiple um, points or you're seeing different people in different places, you don't have to cut across the course constantly. Let's decide. All everybody's gonna be on my left or on my right give a couple of blocks 
um, let's say I'm gonna see you between one oh second and one oh four on my left as I'm coming in. Because sometimes there might be a little obstacle over there. There might be, I don't know, police activity. Maybe there is a water table or something. So, and tell your family and friends to wear something bright so that you can spot them. It's New York, it's November. A lot of people are wearing dark clothes. They all look alike. I always tell my family, wear something red, wear something bright yellow, so that as I'm coming in and TFK I'm standing- green, Rosie. What? TFK green. TFK green is even better. <laughs> TFK shirts for everybody, so that you can spot them. Um, but again, you'll be fine. Have fun, take it all in. It's unfor an unforgettable experience. Oh, fantastic. And Dorothy? Other right. than the so, bathroom, what's you, what you got, girl? Is your TFK singlet? It's how us coaches see you on the course. If you're in your singlet or if you buy the short sleeve, we can spot you and put across the top, not underneath, but across the top in red or hot pink. You want to go opposite the color wheel so it's easy to read in a font that's easy to read put your name. It doesn't have to be your legit name. It could be your nickname, but put something so that people shout your name. One of the biggest energy boost when you're running a marathon is somebody screaming your name. So TFK singlet so that the coaches that are on the course easily spot you, your teammates easily spot you. You feel like you're part of a group when you're out there in the TFK. Best half I ever ran was with Ashley Perlman because people were cheering my name the whole time because she has it in bright pink across the top. You gotta love it. All right. Does anybody have any questions? If you, if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself. I'm gonna tell everyone my biggest piece of advice, which is if you have any questions, ask a TFK coach. This is the huge benefit of being a TFK runner and member. I've benefited greatly. I've absolutely had to call up Asteria and ask her, what do I do with six bruised toenails? And the answer to that was, you probably should have listened to me earlier in the season, Ashley. Um, but, oh, your question is above in the chat. Let's take a look. Lindsay, do you see the question in the chat? And this is from, let's see. I'm not getting the ones that are just- let's Take a look. Frank, let's see your question. It's a watch question. Oh, okay. Thanks. It says question watch, decided definitely Garmin. I guess. Yeah. yeah, I just replied. I believe the 265 is enough. Um, I know that the 965 has the map feature. The likelihood that you're going to start checking your map while you're running the New York City Marathon, mm, very low. So the 265 is enough. Uh, FYI, also realize uh, you're running around a lot of buildings and yeah. all GPS watches are not going to be that accurate come race day. So don't also don't send in that. Even the person that sent in the email says, but my Garmin said it was 26.8. What's going on here? Or, you know, it's 27. It's not oh, going to be accurate. I would like to add something about the distance as well. Nobody is going to be running 26.2 exactly. Maybe, maybe the elite runners, if they follow the blue line, which is painted. No, the blue it's inevitable. The, the blue uh, line. Yeah. That's so, that's so cool. uh, because it's inevitable inevitable that you are going to be doing some weaving around people, moving towards uh, the water, the hydration tables, maybe moving a little further because you're saying uh, hi to your friends and family. So nobody runs 26.2 exactly. And Frank also another has a point. Yeah. It legally can't be to be a certified course, it legally can't be 26.2. There's something called the short course prevention factor which to get certified has to be put in every race. And the purpose of that is if a record is set, it won't be short. 
So you can look at the uh, USATF rules. The course must be slightly over the distance and it has the specification. Sorry to interrupt and, there, Ashley. No, that's okay. And I was gonna say, and Frank, another great, that this is a great question and a great thing to crowdsource, but the best place other than here to crowdsource this is on the Facebook page. Because even if you only get mentors answering this question, you will get probably 15 to 20 mentors answering this question. Uh, you'll get people who have run for a long time with whatever watch they choose. I used to run with an Apple watch. I used to run with a Garmin. I don't know what's better, but these guys will. So feel free to pop into the Facebook page because they will absolutely be able to help you there. Great point. We can help. Even if you can't talk, we still got you, Frank. Uh, any other questions? And if you have any other questions, Facebook is a great spot to hop in. Somebody asked something about sneakers and Yvonne, I'll call in you a second. And I saw within seconds, Jeremy and I saw Dorothy, Glenn and Dave all hop in to answer. So you will always get your questions answered there. Yvonne, what's your question? Okay, I've been to so many running stores and I've never been told if I was an overpronator or an underpronator. Does that mean that I'm I'm like the the middle? I, I've never been like I I feel like I've never been told what what shoe and I'm looking at like the bottom of my running shoe right now and it doesn't look like there's any wear on any side. So does that mean I mean do I need to ask them specifically like what I am? No, I, as as I was saying there, uh being told that you are uh should not mandate what shoe you're in. If you've been comfortable in a certain shoe. You go in and they put you on treadmills and they tell you this, or they do a wet, uh, they make your foot wet and then they see how your arches are. And that's also an indication. But, you know, like I told you, everyone overpronates. Take your regular dress shoes, look at the heel. Why do we get taps put on the heel in the corner? Because when we walk, we overpronate. We overpronate as human beings when we move. That's a fact. So to be told, and then you got to get this particular shoe or that, unless the doctor tells you you don't. If the shoes you have, you like, keep them. Don't touch them. Buy more. Yeah, I was going to add in, you know, unless you have like hip injury, knee injury, and your doctor um, or your physical therapist is saying you need to correct this because there's actually like a, a big disparity between like the height of your hip or um, otherwise almost everybody is in a neutral shoe, right? Yeah. And don't just pick out shoes because they look cute. But no. if you like them and they fit well, pick them because they're cute. Oh, no, no, no. no. Just don't pick them only because they're cute. But we also if live in a cute. world now where people that need what used to be ugly shoes now have better options, like myself. Um, so the world is your oyster when it comes to shoes. Trust us. Um, all right. It is 7.03. Oh, I am going to mention one more thing. We have Coach Jen Hesmer, who has ran our nutrition clinic for several years now, doing our nutrition clinic Tuesday, August 1st at 6 p.m. Uh, Lindsay is dropping the link in the chat. I will be posting this again on social media. We'll be calling it out um, in the weekly email again, I believe. Um, but feel free to come. It is something that, um, as a runner with a sensitive stomach, I have benefited from guys. I just benefited so much. And I can tell you as having worked with TFK for years, just go to all of these. They're really wonderful. You'll learn so much and you'll be a better runner for it. So please feel free to join us Tuesday, August 1st at 6 p.m. via Zoom. If you have any questions, as always, send us an email at teamforkids at myr.org. The lovely Lindsay is often one of the people in the inbox. You can say hi, give her your question, just Tell her she looks lovely and hang day. out, you hang know, out, whatever you chill, want. chat. It's all good. But we are so thrilled to have had you guys for this wonderful Marathon Gear Clinic. Thank you so much to all of our coaches for being so incredible and wonderful. And we cannot wait to see you guys race week and race day. Have a good night, everyone. Bye. Have Thank a good you. Night.